Perfect. Well, we're excited to have you get started. Thanks for joining us today at ISTE 2021. So I just wanted to start by showing you where we're from today in the WebEx window. So right now you're seeing my WebEx screen. You see all our friends waving here. Um, so as you can tell, I've got the power since I'm the teacher for this class that I can mute or unmute all participants. Right now I've got it as unmute all so that we can talk to each other. So if you want to come off mute, ask a question, please do. We've also got the chat panel live here. We'd love if you want to post what you do and where you're coming from and help us understand kind of who we're talking to and let us learn a little bit more about you. <clears throat> Plus something fun to use in the session is this reactions feature. Down in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the smiley face that I can click and actually turn on this little switch so that if I'm doing a physical thumbs up, the WebEx will actually recognize it and give our speakers that good feedback because, you know, joining in these virtual sessions, it's, you got to foster that connection and excitement too. So if people want to give that a try right now, we'd love to see you. <laughs> awesome. Good clapping, guys. Perfect. So we thank you. I'm seeing some familiar names already, which makes me thrilled that you're joining us for a couple multiple sessions. So I have a feeling that we're going to be sending you soon in the mail a Cisco Igloo mug. So to anyone who joins us for three or more sessions, we'll send you this great mug in the mail. And you'll also be entered into a drawing to win a pair of AirPods. So we're getting closer, three quarters of the way through all of our sessions. Today we'll be talking about hybrid student services with Brad and Mary. We've got a couple more sessions coming with other Cisco folks in blue, sharing the latest and greatest features and resources of technologies in the classroom. And then if you want to join in on these green colored sessions, we actually have teachers and school leaders telling about their experience with using technology. So if you want to take a screenshot of this or check back into our Cisco booth on the ISTE homepage, we'd love to have you join us. All right. Well, now is the time. I'm going to pass it over to you, Brad. Do you want to share your screen and tell us a little bit about hybrid student services? Yeah, I'll do that. Before I do that, I just wanted to um, just quickly introduce myself. So I'm Brad Saffer. Um, I'm the global education lead in Cisco's uh, industry solutions group. Um, so I work with all these great people uh, to help drive uh, the best outcomes for you as educators using uh, all of our uh, technologies and all the partners that, that we work with to do that. Um, I do want to say I started my career as a high school and middle school math teacher and coach and advisor, and I was at a very small school um, where I had to, as many educators do, wear many different hats. So it's, it's kind of relevant today as we're talking about um, student services and hybrid student services, the, the need to be able to do a lot of different things and students have a lot of different needs. So I'm super excited uh, to be here today and uh, joined by my good friend and uh, colleague, Mary Slegel Milk, who is as well a former teacher and administrator, um, also works at Cisco. Um, and we've done a lot of these sessions before and I'm just super excited to have her uh, tag team with me. And uh, Mary, why don't you take a second to introduce yourself before we get going? Absolutely. Thanks so much. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. And um, I've been in both rural and urban districts as both a teacher in anything from pre-K through grade 12, but also teaching at the university level in the College of Education. And then I um, most recently, when I came to Cisco, right prior to that, I was with Omaha Public Schools, where I was in charge of all digital learning initiatives and helped build out Network Nebraska, which is a network fiber backbone across the entire state that provides that backbone internet for all the schools and all of our health communities um, across the state. So I'm happy that you're here today. And I think what I'm more excited about is we're gonna touch on hybrid learning, but really we wanna talk about what the services are that you can think about. Because now that we've dipped our toe into how can we provide learning for students and remote parent support and things like that, what are some of the other services in the district that we could be using some of these same collaboration platforms? And so with that, let's just get started. Brad? Thank you, thank you. Let me get my screen up here. Just give me a second. All right, well again, thanks everyone. We're gonna do our very best to make this interactive. Um, please throw questions in the chat, raise your hand if you wanna make a comment um, and or ask a question. Love to have your participation. Uh, uh, in this. So, going to really cover uh, three quick things. Um, 
we're going to talk just as a setup real briefly the in, about the innovation that the pandemic has unleashed. We talk a lot about the negatives and the, and the challenges, which were certainly, uh, you know, very real, um, but where we're going with hybrid services and learning, a lot of that has been driven by the innovation. So we want to touch on that. We want to delve into hybrid student services in particular and, and kind of go through a number of different services and how um, how the move to hybrid can be a real benefit both for the institution, students, parents, teachers, service providers, et cetera. Um, and then we wanna give you a flavor for what uh, Cisco offers uh, as an education company. So real quick, let's just start with Things that I think most of us already know, and and you know, again, we all experienced the pandemic uh, differently. But you know, a year plus ago, we were, you know, trying to wrap up a school year in the Western Hemisphere and uh, United States, and we we couldn't believe that we were were kind of stuck in in distance learning, <laughs> you know, after after three months, and and really what COVID exposed um, was just the tremendous inequities that are built into the systems, the inequity of access, uh, you know, the, the, just the inequity of, of capabilities that different institutions had. And so I think we're even still seeing the, the impacts of that in terms of learning loss and engagement. Um, and it threw just a lot of uncertainty uh, into the works. And, and so, you know, I think when I look back to the spring and even from my own kids experience, it was getting through the, the semester uh, just luckily it was only three months for, for those of us in the US, but then the schools really had to figure out how they were going to pivot um, in the fall. And there was uncertainty there. Are we coming back? We had no idea. Turns out my kids went an entire year, as many did in distance learning, which we just wrapped up a, a couple weeks ago. But the reality is, is that, as I mentioned before, the pandemic did unleash a lot of benefits. If we think about Distance learning is one, one example. Distance learning is not something that's necessarily new, right? But education has been a little bit slow to adopt it for many different reasons, whether it's the quality of the technology, the ease of use of the technology, you know, teachers being more comfortable doing things the way they did. But when we saw this, what I call this period of forced experimentation, um, it really did drive a lot of, of uh, uh, positive outcomes, um, and Mary, you can speak to this too, but you know, we, we know that many students actually did better um, in the pandemic uh, because being on a screen and being focused and, and in their own space was, was better for them, or being able to take a, you know, a, a, a video. So when, when flipped learning was instituted, being able to watch a video over and over uh, at their own pace was was better than having to sit in a classroom and try to keep up with the teacher as they lectured, right? So all of these these uh, uh, things that were were really designed to keep learning going and kind of keep the operation going for many students um, provided uh, provided unique opportunities, and the same for uh, same for teachers as well. So um, Mary, I don't know if you want to comment on that just from what you've been seeing. Absolutely. Just one comment on this as well is um, we really started helping some of our um, entities that we were working with with research about the models of learning that we could identify that were happening during the pandemic and, and how we're going to be really reimagining um, what does a, an effective model for specific learner types. And so schools are really starting to rethink and reimagine um, you know, more than just one model of learning for their students and and, you know, yes, in person is great and that's what's needed for some students. But we also really found out that some students excelled in in this remote environment. And so now schools are reimagining what should the models be that they provide to their community, their school community. So it's pretty exciting. We're in an exciting time as we rethink the future of teaching and learning. Yeah, absolutely. And then when we think about where we can take these different models in the future, there's there's so much um, that we can look at from just more immersive learning experience. So leveraging new technologies to design those experiences. Um, you know, the obviously, you know, learning from anywhere, we learned that we can learn from anywhere, right? I mean, kids were, were picking up laptops and, you know, uh, they were studying and, and attending class in, in many cases, you know, on the go. I mentioned the self-paced piece. That's a really, really important one. Um, and I think uh, also looking a little further ahead, we look at artificial intelligence from the standpoint of 
helping identify um, specific types of interventions or personalizations that can help individual students based on all of this data now that we're seeing trafficked um, over the network. Um, very exciting times there. And I think the other point of this too is the fact that these things now are, once, once you've tasted the benefits of this, if you're a student or a parent or, or a teacher um, who was able to, to teach remotely in, in some cases, um, it's hard to give that up. So, uh, you know, going back to the way things were before, I believe is uh, not an option. And, and the schools, uh, a lot of schools are starting to embrace those uh, changes. So, we're going to focus on hybrid services today, but it's important to put it in the context more broadly around hybrid campus. Because again, we think about the need for a hybrid world in really two main sides of the coin. The first side of that coin is being prepared in case there's another pandemic, being prepared in case there's some environmental uh, catastrophe out here in California. We've had schools closed due to wildfires. There's all kinds of things that can happen. So there is kind of a defensive posture that schools need to think about in terms of being able to be ready for that next challenge. But again, as we've been talking about the on the, the positive sides, the positive outcomes that we're, we're seeing um, out of hybrid and, and remote um, are ones that, that uh, need to be kept. We've talked about the learning side, the new learning models, the choice for students to either be in person or in, you know, in the classroom and different students have very different needs there. So being set up for hybrid, super important. And then where we're talking today, the services, that's a huge piece. So we think about learning as a service, there's a whole bunch of services and we'll go through them from occupational therapy, speech therapy, advising, tutoring, counseling, et cetera. Same things, the same types of uh, benefits that apply to the learning uh, apply to services. Um, on the flip side, when you're thinking about your staff, the hybrid work piece is super important, right? So if we're gonna have a hybrid campus and hybrid services, then, then the people doing the work and delivering the service also need to be uh, you know, able to, to do so in a hybrid environment. Um, and then we also look at all of this being uh, underpinned by you know, the smart campus. So you have to have really the technology infrastructure uh, to be able to do that. And a lot of schools are, are really taking a closer look at that infrastructure, not only for all of the things we have here in terms of the things you can do differently, but also in terms of being able to operate more efficiently. And right now, you know, cost is a, is a big issue there. So with that, let me turn it over to Mary to talk a little mm -hmm. bit first about the distinction between hybrid learning and hybrid services. Mary? Yeah, I just want to put us on a level playing field here on the definition, because what I have noticed as I have worked with so many schools and advising, what are the models that they're thinking about? They sometimes get um, kind of mixed up with what they're really trying to do. So in context here, we'd like to say that hybrid learning combines that traditional classroom teaching with online and remote activities, meaning allowing students to come in maybe remote synchronously into a traditional classroom. So when we think about that, what's the hybrid services? And that's combining traditional models of student services with online or remote experiences. So when we look at this, we wanna kind of put it in context. And let's go on to the next slide, Brad, because I think you know, we've seen a lot of hybrid learning examples, the challenges, difficulty moving to distance learning or the lack of student engagement. You know, these were the things that we were seeing that students were having trouble connecting. Just connectivity was huge, right? Yeah. But the results allowed for that flexibility for students to attend in person or remote or to attend remotely synchronously, but also they could do asynchronous if they needed to. That flexibility for the teachers as well. I spoke with many teachers that said, you know what, I'm in a compromised health situation, so I'm going to teach remotely back to the classroom. And there was a para in the classroom helping out. So here are just some you know, great examples that we've all really kind of embraced as we've gone through about the last 18 months. Um, but let's, let's dive into Another example that I that I really kind of want to showcase here, because it's not just this type of learning environment that's true academics, but on that next slide, when we when we look at this, I want to think about our choral programs, 
Um, think about vocal programs, band programs. There is a music enhancement mode within the collaboration tool that really allows for real-time collaboration. A band can, in a unique band, and, and I say unique because they were awesome, they were all at home during the pandemic, but with music mode turned on, they were able to practice together in small groups, but also in as a whole band. But to kind of, you know, celebrate those everyday heroes that were really trying to say, hey, just our core, we need more than that. Because it's it's about connecting. It's about, you know, just that social emotional of being with our peers. And so we celebrated with Chris Martin from Coldplay and we connected to our everyday heroes, our teachers and our students in Australia, a couple of schools in the United States and in Britain and in Canada. And it was really great because they got a one-on-one -on -one tutorial with Chris Martin. And we thought that was really great. So if you have not seen some of this work that we do at Cisco um, or haven't attended a virtual field trip, you know, I would also encourage you to go to a partner of ours, the Center for Interactive Learning and Collaboration, known as CILC. Um, and I'll put their um, um, URL in the chat for you. Go there and you can collaborate with other teachers. If you go to the collaboration tab and you can find another teacher and say, hey, let's connect and lesson plan together and connect our classes. Or you can go on virtual field trips. Um, yesterday, we went to the Alaska Sea Life Center on a virtual field trip for the last session of our day yesterday. And so I encourage you to think about um, connecting outside of your geographic region as well. But let's dive deeper into services, because as we think about services at a school, teaching and learning comes up, first of all, because that's one of our main core services, right? Students and parents now have choice. When do students go to school? Maybe we can play with, and I say that just really figuratively, to say, hey, can students come from maybe the last three periods of the day where they know certain courses that they want direct instruction in person traditional classroom environment, and then be at school ready for athletics and things like that. But the morning, maybe they're like they're solid in math and they're solid in science and they think, you know what, I'd rather attend either virtually to the virtual school or I could attend to the hybrid and then you know, sign off and do my work. I have a granddaughter that loves this way. She says, you know what, that, that passing period, look at how much time I saved by not having to do passing period. I could still be working on homework. Look at how much time I saved by not having to go to the cafeteria when I'm really not hungry. Or, you know, whatever it is that students that we do as administrators to manage our students in their movement through the building, sometimes the students are saying, you know, that's the time I could be doing homework or I could be working on assignments. So the benefits of hybrid in teaching and learning are fantastic. Let's go on to the next one, tutoring. This really allows for us to think about the flexibility of staffing and that easier scheduling to make sure that if a student really needs tutoring right after math class, can we set up for a para or a math tutor to be available for these students? I have one school that is allowing the high school students to tutor to the elementary students. And so they just set it up to where, you know, John from, you know, the, the um, <coughs> excuse me, the junior class is going to, you know, via video come into a third grade classroom and students can go to a small desktop video unit or get on their laptop and they can join in. Next one we're looking at, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> is the AP and the honors courses or at the elementary level, we call those how courses, high ability learner courses. And again, personalized learning, flexible scheduling. Teachers many times went from building to building. So now we can save on fuel costs, but we can also save on teacher time. Mm -hmm. But now the teachers have the ability to really have dynamic groups of students. I have one teacher and she was having a book study <coughs> on the Holocaust and she had like five books. And if she just kept the book study to the one school, a student might just choose number of the stars and that might be only one student in that school. But at the five other schools she also had, she had other students that chose that book and now she can bring them all together for a literature circle. 
So it allows us to be flexible in our teaching, it allows us to really have that flexible staff, but there is some cost savings there, again, with time, teacher time, as well as travel time or travel costs. So Mary, let me, if I, can I jump in yeah, before uh, you jump in? Yeah, ITC? yeah I think th those points are so important. So when, when I think about, um, we can think about this in, in the context of one school, but sometimes it's it's also good to think about the con uh, this in the context of your school within a district, right? Where in, in many cases there are shared resources. And so a lot of times it's hard to find those quality resources, right? So that flexible staffing piece, whether it's a tutor and, and, and a number of the other um, services that we have on here is really important um, for both in terms of having access to and kind of expanding the access that you have to quality staff. So being able to go from, you know, having to have a person physically uh, residing in or, or, or being, you know, at on the school grounds to then being able to be in a remote setting if it's that staff person. Um, and then also this idea, I love this idea on the on the, the um, high ability learners piece where you do have students, uh, you can group students from different schools who, you know, if there weren't an, uh, the ability to leverage a single teacher and resource to, to teach mm -hmm. them, you, you, you just wouldn't be able to offer them that because you can't offer an individual teacher to each kid at each school. So if I kind of, I think about this in terms of if you kind of have a, a pool of staff and then you have kids and you're constantly moving them around and grouping them depending on the service that they need, uh, the type of, of uh, um, teaching that they need, et cetera. Um, and so I think that's just such an important thing. It's, it's, you know, cost savings, yes, because you can leverage individual resources across multiple schools, but also quality as well, right? I think that's a really good point. So yeah, let me give you another across. example of that. Yeah. Um, because we had, um, you know, six high schools that um, maybe it was the AT, um, the honors German courses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, by the time they get into three, four, and five, six, and seven, eight level German, then that's when they were noticing class size was getting down to five yeah. or three. And yeah. so then what we were doing is saying, well, can that teacher, because they teach all levels of German, just put all the kids in to one class. So that teacher could be teaching, you know, three different years of German in one class period, right? Which is sometimes difficult. Now, what we can do is say to those teachers, hey, we can just have a whole class of that fourth year German by bringing in students from the various other schools as well. And then thinking about highly qualified teachers, I think about Mr. Thompson, a science teacher, and he just had a way of reaching through that screen and helping students really just dynamically. He could just touch them in, in a way in which students wanted to learn and they were engaged. That is the teacher that we needed for students at all of the various schools. So to yeah. leverage, but also, and I didn't even put this on the, on the list, is that ability to mentor other teachers during these types of engagements as well. That is a professional development service that we need to think about. Yeah. Absolutely. So let's go on to the next one, advising right. and mentoring. You know, because this one is really important as we think about timely interventions, improved student access. How can we make sure that whether we have mentors from the community coming into the school to mentor students? I mean, we, they need to be in a secure environment, but it needs to be timely. I mean, there was many times that we were asked, okay, can you find mentors in the community? And by the time they drive to the school, get through, find a parking spot, then get through security and then get to the student. And sometimes to find out, oh, the student's not there that particular day because of illness or something like that. Well, now we can be a little bit more timely in our intervention, timely in the number of times we meet and what's really great is I had a mentor that was an architect for an engineering student, and he said, instead of skipping our time next week, I'm bringing you on a field trip with me. I have to go inspect a bridge. So he had his iPad, and he said, I need you to see what I'm looking at and inspecting. I mean, a student couldn't have been able to leave school for that type of activity. So I think as we think about ways in which we want to advise students or mentor them, we need to think about some of this 
you know, using the collaboration tools that we use in the teaching and learning environment. Yeah, I Do think we're going to see if just one one other um, point on that is that, you know, with such a drive now to to make sure that we're <clears throat> giving students the skills they need to be prepared for college or career, making those connections that you mentioned, Mary, are super, super important. So. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the health services 1, you know, we, we do a lot in, in that area. Um, at Cisco, but, you know, same idea of, of the, the idea of a, of a telehealth visit was was always out there before the pandemic. But I think culturally, and this applies to all the things we're talking about until we were forced <laughs> to do some of these things. Um, we, we would always go back to the old, old way. I, I have 1 example from, uh, I had a telehealth visit for something really simple. Um got on the, you know, I got on WebEx with the, with the doctor and, and in 15 minutes, you know, I was done and I was like, oh my God, that was so great. I didn't have to go into the off, into the, into the, uh, uh, you know, to the clinic and, and all that good stuff. And, and same with health services where there's a lot of things that um, can be taken care of um, virtually, not everything, of course, but think about the efficiencies that are driven uh, by that uh, ability to do that. Think about, um, the ability for those those healthcare providers to then be able to spend more of their time on the you know the in person or the 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 more critical uh, things that uh, that they have to to deal with. So again, you think about uh, it's it's all about this efficiency and again the ability to to share those resources um, as well. Yeah, I like your example with efficiency. And again, in my district, we had one nurse to um, a team of buildings. And it just seemed like that team of buildings kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And then they were asking the school secretary, or sometimes they would have a para, um, a paraprofessional be that, that stand in um, to help and then use video services to call to where the nurse is. And so those yeah. are some of the things that we're seeing. I worked with one school district, very, very rural, and they said, you know what? We just called right into the community health clinic for things like pink eye and things like that. So then when the parent picked up the student from school, they went through the CVS or the um, pharmacy and they were able to pick up the script because they had already seen the doctor through the telehealth services that the school and the community clinic had pre set up. Yeah. So, again, I think we're going to start thinking about ways in which we can be faster and easier to support our families. The last or the next two speech therapy and occupational therapy. I'm going to clump these together just a little bit when I'm talking about them. Um, I was working at a university in which we really were, were looking at training therapists to use this type of technology. And, and they were saying that what they noticed is, especially where we don't have a therapist that is for just 1 building, they have to travel between buildings. Again, that's that same saving on time and saving on costs, but also many times when they stop at a building to pick up the student from the classroom and do a pull out for speech or occupational therapy, they're trying to find that of next available room. Well, let's just stop in here and it's another new room for a student and they're like, well, what is this room about? You know, well, what we were noticing is they were, you know, screen children. And so when they're getting this type of therapy through the screen, they were engaged. They were right there paying attention. Yeah. And so they said that we, we were noticing an increase in the level of therapy was better, but also they could do more sessions per week. Mm -hmm. And and this isn't to saying that it should stop that in person, but a balance between a hybrid type as well as an in-person type. Yeah. And in, and we know in some states we have like educational service units that provide services to multiple districts. They hire these therapists, the school psychologists and things like that. And then they drive to these various areas. And that's why I was saying to Shannon, I said, you know, getting through an IEP meeting was like aligning planets just so that we could mm -hmm. get the school psychologist and everybody in the same meeting. Well, now by using this collaborative model, of, of technology, it, I think that we're faster to IEP meetings. Yeah, I want to make yeah. another comment on that too. I think that um, because I think there are clearly some legitimate uh, questions around the effectiveness of of being 
remote from a service provider versus in, you know, live in person. Um, but if I think about my experience working at Cisco, I, for a long, you know, I, I think Mary, when you and I were working together, I, we were virtual for a while, but then we got to meet at a conference, right? And having that one interaction and, and hanging out from that day forward, you know, when we were on WebEx together, it was completely different. And so I think for a lot of schools, um, still including, you know, we're not saying abandon the in-person stuff, right? So for example, if you're gonna have an, a, a, you know, set up a student with a mentor, it's probably a good idea to have that first meeting in person if you can do it, right? Because there is definitely something to the in-person experience and establishing the relationship, but then being able to keep that conversation mm -hmm. and that relationship going in a, in a hybrid fashion um, is where you really get those efficiencies. So I wanna make that choice. We're not saying abandon, as, and you made the point too. I wanna emphasize what you said, not saying to abandon the in-person experience um, at all. Yeah. yeah. And then this last one, and I think this one should have probably been up at the top because I think in the K-12 environment, this is what's so important about parent-teacher communication and, and how can we just sometimes be very timely in our communication. Sometimes it's just a message, but we yeah. want to be in a secure environment and not using I am on our personal cell phone. And so thinking about using that infrastructure of the collaboration tools to give us security, but to give Leah us that timely option of messaging or calling, um, that just really engages our parents. And yeah. I think that's what's really important. Yeah. Another piece in this one, another example is Let's think about using this type of collaboration environment to have the parents join class to see class presentations to, you know, at the elementary level, I always had to take off work to drive over to the elementary school and see the musical performance, right? Mm -hmm. The high school ones that my children were in when they were in high school, those were always in the evenings. They were a little bit easier to manage, but the other ones that were during the day, I mean, now I can come in via video and I can engage with my child when they come home and say, I saw you, you did a fantastic job. And I think that's a super important piece for us to start thinking about. It's a community that our schools are in and we have to really engage that community in all levels when we're using a collaboration tool. Excellent. Well, that was great. Mary, thank you for walking us through. And uh, Shannon, I really appreciated your comment about uh, the, you know, we aren't, we are going to be looking at these types of things moving forward now that, uh, that, uh, we, we've seen them in action. Um, okay. So let's go on, uh, with a little bit of time we have left. We just want to show you a bit about, uh, Cisco and where we play in the space and how, uh, WebEx can, um, support, uh, this journey to hybrid. Sorry about that. that got a little quick. Um, this is, this is an issue with this slide, by the way. Um, I'm going to have to keep bouncing back here. Um, we talk about at Cisco the importance of building a foundation um, that is simple and secure. You can't deliver any of these services uh, easily um, if your technology foundation is not um, is not in place from the start. And we'll show you a little bit more about uh, where that is. But in terms of WebEx, Mary, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So WebEx is really about a full platform that is video endpoint devices, a desktop device, it may be your your um, own devices of a cell phone, a laptop, whatever. But also think about a camera in the classroom that automatically tracks the teacher as they're moving about the room. It's about creating specialized experiences for graduation or a specialized experience like we've done. You've seen a Capitol building or um, there because there's there's a specialized WebEx for legislative for school board meetings, things like that. Mm -hmm. It's a full collaboration suite. And I kind of talked about this a minute ago about the safety and the security of this as a service. And, and what's really nice is I have a district they'll be um, talking later today, Louisville. They said, we had to choose WebEx because our teachers can use their own device to call parents, but it registers as their school phone number. And they said, we wanted our teachers to be safe. And we wanted them to I am in a platform in which we could also document that our teachers were connecting with our families. So this is it's a it's about a whole route well rounded experience with artificial intelligence embedded in it with security embedded in it and it's really designed to be very flexible. 
Time's gotten away from us a little bit, Brad. So we're going to rush through. Rolling. Yep. Um, <laughs> so as we think about seamless collaboration, smart hybrid experiences, it's about every type in that list is, I think, we just need to think about whatever we're doing now at our schools. Can we use some type of a collaboration environment to help make this the environment better? And it's really about being digital first engagements that are intelligent experiences. They're really designed to be secure and private. And there's a reason why our security and privacy, that purple is really hard to read. I just noticed that and <laughs> yeah. I apologize. But it's it's the underlying feature of everything. So let's keep going. As we talk about this, the all new WebEx, we have made, we're making changes to WebEx about every month. Um, and what's really important is to, if you haven't played out with the layouts in that upper right corner, you should see a layout button and you can go into a stage or stacked or side by side, or you can pin people and say, I always wanna see that person talking. And that way, everybody else that as they come in and out talking, they will rotate or move, or as they use hand gestures, they also rotate and move around the screen as well. Another great feature is on the next slide is um, what we're talking about is the translation capabilities. And this is one where I want you to think about is right now, many of our schools are paying for translations mm -hmm. to be added to recorded um, videos that they've created. So they've had to download the recording, they've had to turn it, put it into the translation service and then store it someplace else. Well, now with WebEx, that's all included together and, and it's available. And it's when it says and more, um, it's up to over 100 languages now that the translations are available. So again, you have closed captioning, you have real-time translation, and you can get a full transcript um, of that session. Incredible. And then with the next slide, I'm really excited about um, the, our acquisition of Slido. Slido really is going to help with engaging our students and engaging our parents. You can use live polls, build quizzes, build a word cloud. Maybe you want to do an activity while students are coming in and getting settled and while you let them enter the room, if you invoke some of the security features, and then they can have a question up and they can just answer that question and it builds your word cloud that can be the start of the conversation of that direct instruction that you're going to be working on. And with that, I think we're towards the end, Brad. Yeah, I just wanna wrap up with a couple other things before I pass it to Heather. The first is um, just to let you know a bit about Cisco. We've talked about a lot about our collaboration portfolio today, but um, important to understand that we have a portfolio that covers all of your bases. What you're looking at here is the, the static version of our portfolio explorer for education. This is on our website. We will include the link to this in our resource slide. Um, but we have built uh, our solutions around your business needs at your school, um, whether it's building the flexible campus around core networking to streamlining administration, developing hybrid learning environments and services, um, making sure physical and cyber security are top of mind. And then we also, for our higher education institutions, um, have solutions for uh, research. When you go on to the Portfolio Explorer, you can click into any one of the use cases below those five themes that I just mentioned and see a lot more detail um, in terms of the solutions themselves, but more importantly, a lot of great customer stories. Uh, we talk about really the business drivers um, that are driving the implementation of each of these use cases. So really encourage you to, uh, to take a look at that when we wrap up. Um, and then I really just wanna put in a plug for uh, Cisco as an education company. Um, we're more than just a technology company. We are an education company at our heart. Um, we were founded uh, on a college campus. So learning and innovation are in our DNA. The solutions I just showed you on that portfolio explorer are, are secure, simple, and seamless. Um, we work with a lot of partners as well um, to, to augment those solutions. Um, we have the world's largest classroom in the Cisco Networking Academy, which uh, some of you may be familiar with. So we're actually teaching with you as well. Um, and then we continue to make investments in education through our DevNet program, our Country Digital Acceleration program, which invests in more innovative project, and then our Global Problem Solvers Challenge, uh, which gets uh, teachers and students from around the world um, developing solutions in a, in a really fun global competition. Um, and all of this is in service of our motto, which is that we are committed to building an inclusive future for all.
Um, before we wrap, uh, I wanted to leave you with a few things. We'll leave you with this slide, but uh, please visit our website. We've got a lot of great information there. The Portfolio Explorer that I mentioned. We've got a great blog series uh, on um, real thought leadership topics, uh, both in uh, schools and higher education. And then for educators, we have a re uh, the Cisco Education uh, Resource Center, which provides teachers with the resources they need um, to, do, to do their job, to do it uh, in, with hybrid learning, distance learning, um, and to, to really explore different types of learning models that, that we did today. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and turn the ball over to Heather. Heather, thanks so much. Any questions? I know we're short on time, but um, any questions that are burning that we can help with? Okay, Heather. All right, thank Heather. You. All right, well, thank you, Brad. Thank you, Mary. That was awesome. Um, we did put a copy of the presentation in the digital tote bag, so take a peek there if you'd like to grab that. And then we will be posting the recording for this session as well in um, ISTE. So if you want to share it with any of your colleagues, you can do that. Um, I know Brad went over some of all the great resources that we have at Cisco um, around education. Um, you can pull up this QR code that we have here. Um, also check out our microsite that we have. And, and on top of that, we have a virtual booth at Cisco. So you can connect with people like Mary and Brad over there as well. So um, we do have, a, um, I think it's like five more sessions coming up here, um, a few more today and then a couple tomorrow. So um, a sneak peek at those are here. We have a session coming up right now in about 14 minutes um, to talk about Meraki. So uh, feel free to join us and Thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate you spending time with Cisco during your busy week at ISTE. And thank you for all you do for education and students. We really appreciate you being here. Have a great day. Yeah, thanks Bye. everyone. Have a great one. Take care. Take care.